I'm normally on at this time, uh, but Dr. Deagle is, is not here today, uh, and Chris won't be here, so I have an hour, uh, and there's a lot of breaking news I have to cover. Uh, the Ukraine has closed eight border crossings uh, on reports of Russian troop movements across the border. Uh, this is not uh, a large-scale Russian invasion, but there have been multiple sightings of Russian uh our forces entering from Russia, whether they're Russian or Ukrainians going back in, uh, in some cases driving our, uh, armored vehicles, um, in other cases driving trucks with the heavy machine guns mounted on them and so forth. Uh, there's also a report uh, that a, uh, a group uh, that Russia used uh, in Chechnya to fight the uh, the extremists there has been reconstituted and is being sent in uh, in eastern Ukraine across the border. Uh, these are very tough, battle-hardened uh, soldiers that uh, fought the uh, the extremists, the Russia or the. Uh, um, Muslim extremists in Chechnya, and uh, it appears that uh, Putin is sending them in. Now, Putin has seen the trap that's been set for him uh, in the Ukraine. In other words, if he goes in, uh, he ties uh, Russian forces down, and uh, they're right currently are, are large NATO and U, uh, U.S. In, in the case of Israel and, and in Jordan, NATO forces operating on the uh, border of Syria, both in Jordan and in uh, and in Israel. Uh, the there's a theory that I happen to subscribe to, by the way, that. The Russian forces uh, being tied down may prevent Russia from offering a response to an, an all-out NATO invasion uh, of Syria. Now, it won't be called an invasion. It'll be called a humanitarian exercise or, or some other nonsense. But in reality, it will be an invasion. Uh, in the last year and a half, on two different occasions, Russia prevented uh, a major general eastern war from breaking out. The first time was uh, a proposed joint U.S.-Israeli attack on Iran, and uh, Russia let it know that it would not tolerate that, sent some military forces. Uh, beefed up uh, the Syrian uh, military, and the second time was uh, when uh, supposedly we were using the uh, uh, issue of Syrian chemical warfare uh, arsenals as a trigger or as an excuse to, to go into Syria. And at that point in time, this uh, Russian Navy uh, with several very large warships uh, steamed uh, into the Mediterranean, the Eastern Med, right off the shores of uh, Israel and uh, Syria and Lebanon. And uh, the United States uh, decided to back away at that time. So part of what is happening in Ukraine is an attempt to tie down um, Russian forces and to create an opportunity to get a general war in the Middle East going. Um, that is, by the way, absolutely uh, insane. The Iranians, uh, and I, Dr. Bell and I have talked about this on the show before, but the Iranians, when the Soviet Union uh, fell, went in and uh, offered uh, high-paying jobs to a large number of uh, scientists working in what was called BioPreparPot, which was the Soviet Advanced Biological Warfare Program. Uh, there are three main forms of global strategic warfare. Scalular warfare, which most people know very little about, and a lot of which is based on the works of the late Nikolai Tesla. Um, advanced biological warfare, which uh, 
most people have a very limited understanding of, and then global thermonuclear warfare. And even there, most people, their, their level of understanding stops at about the mid-60s. In terms of advanced biological warfare, if you say bio-war to most people, they think of powdered anthrax or something like that. That's basically your grandfather's bio-war. Uh, advanced biological warfare is recombinant DNA genetic engineering technologies, where they take snippets uh, of DNA from various viruses, combine them to create a brand new virus, or take an existing virus, uh, which is not particularly lethal or not lethal to humans, uh, add uh, some uh, snippets from uh, some viruses and change the virus into a, uh, a deadly bio-war weapon. Now, the Iranians have a massive bio-war um, complex. They, there have been stories a year, year and a half ago in British papers of uh, various groups in Africa complaining about the large number of primates being shipped to Iran, uh, particularly you know, in some endangered species of apes and, and monkeys. They're being shipped there for testing uh, of, because the primates are much closer to humans than lab rats or what other. And they're testing various agents, uh, uh, viral agents, on these primates. Now, if, and by the way, uh, the, it's just come out this week, within the last uh, couple days, that Israel is now stationing three of its very expensive, very high-tech German-manufactured submarines. They're conventionally powered uh, off of the Iranian coast in the Persian Gulf. Now, these subs can launch cruise missiles with uh, nuclear warheads, um, and three subs would have enough cruise missiles uh, with high thermal nuclear warheads to take out every major city in Iran. Um, the Iranians will not allow themselves or their allies, Syria, to be destroyed. And uh, if push comes to shove, they can push back. Now, of course, if Israel cuts loose with its nuclear arsenal, uh, in effect, Iran will cease to exist. There won't be, a, certainly in the city areas, there won't be enough living to bury the dead. But Iran will be able to respond in kind, not with nuclear warheads, but with advanced biological warheads. She also is highly apt in that case to respond against North America and Europe. And in other words, the NATO countries, the United States, Canada, UK, France, Germany, etc. If you want to know what advanced bio war is like, the, the closest thing historically is the Black Death, the bubonic plague of um, the Middle Ages in Europe. Um, that was not actually a virus, it was a bacteria. And it killed between a third and half of the European population. People would come down with the disease or at least notice they had the disease in the morning. By night, they were dead. And in many cases, they simply sewed themselves up into um, a burial shroud. And uh, they, they were mass burnings of, of bodies and, and uh, carts going around, bring out your dead, bring out your dead. It was a horrific nightmare. That was essentially how they're a natural disease. Uh, if we get into advanced bio war uh, nightmare scenario, it literally will be a nightmare from hell. But there won't be one virus. There could be 50 or 100 released. So the war that people are pushing and working towards is a war that is apt to wipe out most of the human race. We'll try not to be quite so so uh, uh, scary in the next uh, segment. Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. This is Tim Alexander. Okay, I 
want to finish up on some of the uh, latest European news, uh, the Ukrainian war. Um, there appears to be uh, what the, the, some, play, uh, some sources are calling a rebel breakthrough. Uh, I'm, I don't think I really like the term rebel, uh, but the pro-Russian uh, separatist forces uh, have been seizing border crossings. And what this is doing is allowing uh, Russia to feed across a large number of volunteers. Some are Russian citizens, some are former Ukrainian citizens uh, in the, the now independent parts of uh, the Ukraine. They're also sending in uh, more sophisticated weaponry. They've shot down four helicopters in the last two days, uh, and uh, at least a couple have been the Hein 24D models. Um, the Russians, uh, and before that the Soviets, uh, had a, a different approach to uh, attack helicopters than the West did. They used a combination of a transport helicopter and an attack helicopter. That was the Hein 24D. Uh, it's a very tough uh, helicopter. It's got uh, it can fire a lot of anti-tank, anti-personnel missiles. It has a 23 millimeter uh, chin-mounted uh, automatic Gatling gun. Um, it's pretty tough, but all helicopters, uh, because they're fairly fairly slow and sometimes hover uh, in, in battle to engage the enemy more precisely. They tend to be sitting ducks. And uh, that's one of the, the, the reasons that uh, you have an Air Force and not just uh, helicopter-borne forces to support your troops. Uh, jets come in very fast. Um, they have uh, uh, you know, all kind of uh, ordnance they can deliver, but they deliver it at several hundred miles an hour. Now, it appears that uh, Vladimir Putin's strategy is, at this point, is to avoid the the uh, trap of getting involved in an all-out invasion, but to send in irregular forces, uh, so-called volunteers, to send in uh, increasingly sophisticated weaponry. Later this month, there'll be a large NATO force operating in the western Ukraine, perhaps in the eastern Ukraine. That uh, is a is just a script for absolute disaster while a civil war is going on in Ukraine, and it appears with every passing day that the the war that's actually going on in the Ukraine is getting worse. Um, the Ukrainian junta forces are violating uh, international law right and left. They have shelled several hospitals with both artillery and, and mortar fire, uh, including a children's hospital. Uh, the most recent horrific thing, uh, basically yesterday, they not only shelled a hospital, but then their forces came in, their ground forces came in, went into the hospital, and killed an estimated 25 uh, wounded uh, uh, separatist fighters, uh, literally went in and, and, and shot them at point blank range. Now, that's a war crime under international law. And, uh, you know, as horrific as war is, the various nations over the last few centuries, the various nations that basically have engaged in war, have put some limits, some parameters on what can and can't be done. For instance, you're not allowed to use what's called dum-dum shells or hollow-point ammunition. The Ukrainian forces have been using that. Uh, that's a violation. You don't attack ambulances. Uh, you don't kill the wounded. You don't attack civilians. Uh, certainly not hospitals. That's a violation of, of various treaties uh, and international law. The fascist forces uh, under the Ukrainian junta have been violating all that, and fairly consistently. I think part of it is they're trying to gloat uh, Putin and trying to put pressure on Putin from his own people to come in. They clearly want Putin to invade, to tie him down. Uh, so far, Putin is avoiding that. By the way, Putin and President Obama and many other leaders today uh, are 
in Normandy, uh, the big D-Day uh, uh, celebration is tomorrow, 70 years after the invasion. Uh, so, But today and tomorrow, uh, many of the world's leaders, European and American Canadian leaders, will be uh, and are in Normandy. It's hard to believe 70 years, but the my parents' generation that fought the uh, Second World War, most are gone now, and uh, especially the men, but even most of the women, but especially the men, very few of the uh, many, many, oh, over 150,000 troops that invaded uh, on June 6th, uh, 70 years ago, are alive. And um, of those that are there, there's several hundred that are still there. Many are in wheelchairs, and they're they're in their late 80s or 90s. But many have flown over to make one last visit. Um, when you look at the European wars that uh, we have seen, and there have been three really major wars. Uh, the first was the Napoleonic Wars, which were which was kind of a, a world war in beta testing. Uh, then the the Great War, as it was called, uh, the First World War, and then the Second World War. The same people, their same group of people, the, the, their descendants are behind this, and that's the global banking cartel families. Uh, they profit from getting the goy or the Gentile to kill the Gentile, financing both sides, and um, they've been doing that now for over 200 years and very successful. Very successfully, they usually back both sides and they ensure that the victor makes the loser uh, honor their agreements with the banks to pay the banks off. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, when you look at the enormous death, suffering, destruction that has taken place in the world and in Europe. Uh, for almost you know 200 years now, it's just unbelievable. And now we're going down that path again. But what is very different now than the Second World War, the First World War, the Napoleonic Wars, we now have the ability to basically wipe out all higher forms of life on this planet. Um, and again, getting back to the three uh, global strategic forms of warfare, nuclear, advanced biological, and scalular. It, we have what's called a MAD, a Mutually Assured Destruction, with countries like Russia, China, Iran, and so forth. You have to be insane to provoke a war that will kill you, even if you can kill your enemy. That doesn't make sense. Okay, when we come back, we're going to kind of get off the war thing and look at some other uh, breaking news issues. about really depressing things uh, uh, in terms of uh, where we may be going with this Ukrainian war. Um, now let's talk about something else that's uh, not a real upbeat. Uh, the trouble is, uh, if you do the news today and you're honest as opposed to the uh, mainstream media, which is basically 96% owned by six companies, uh, all globalist owned and Zionist ran, uh, we're at the point where the, new, the mainstream media today is very similar to what it was in the Soviet Union during the height of uh, communism. It's all propaganda. It's all lies. It's all spin. Well, that's what we've got right now. But we do have the Internet. We do have talk radio. Uh, they haven't shut us down yet. And there are, those of us in the alternative media are making a big effort to, uh, to try to, to get some truth out. Uh, I don't make any money at this. 
uh, I just get uh, more entries on my uh, national security and FBI file for daring to criticize Obama and the jerks running the country. Well, okay, I can live with that. Um, anyway, let's talk about what's happening economically to this country. We're being destroyed. Uh, right now, the half the country makes less than $27,520 a year. That's not much money, particularly for a family. Um, and there's, I've linked an article here. It's, it's really good. Half the country makes less than $27,520 a year and 15 other signs that the uh, middle class is dying. Now, let's go through a few of the signs. Uh, according to a brand new CNN poll, 59% of Americans believe it's become impossible for most people to achieve the American dream. And uh, that's sad. Uh, in reality, I, to, to some extent, it's sad that only 59%, because it's pretty obvious it's in your face. Uh, but young adults age 18 to 20 to 34 are most likely to feel the dream is unaffordable, with 63% saying it's impossible. Uh, many of these people have never experienced uh, a period of good employment. Uh, you know, I teach at the college level, and I ask my students, uh, guys, if you uh, really worked at it and went out, could you find a 40-hour week job at $10 an hour? And most of them say no. Um, and try to live off $400 a week, particularly if you have a family, if you're trying to buy a house, uh, get a couple cars, you get your wife, and so forth. It's it, it just... There's not enough money uh, to do that, and yet most can't even get that kind of that level of job. And I'm here in the American Midwest. Uh, it's always been a great place to live, but uh, more and more, I don't think there are very many great places to live in America unless you're extremely wealthy. Uh, number two on the hit parade here: more Americans and others believe that home ownership is not a key to long-term wealth and prosperity. Uh, this goes back to the great American dream uh, is dying. We had a period where the banksters went amuck with with uh, financing homes, particularly in areas like California, for people that did not qualify. They were, in many cases, were illegal aliens. They had no documentation, uh, no money uh, to speak of, and yet they were given loans on homes costing a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, given enough money down to make payments for a few months, and then everything went belly up. That's fraud, and it's fraud on a massive scale, but nobody on Wall Street, none of the Two big to fail bankers went to prison for it. Heck, most of them were never even called before a grand jury. Um, and that's things like that are deliberate. And any any banker uh, throughout history can tell you you don't make loans to people that aren't employed and don't have any money in the bank. You don't make a couple hundred thousand dollar loan to them. It's not going to work. You don't have to be a genius to figure that out. But yet, we were making loans like that by the millions. Uh, number three, the rate uh, overall, the rate of home ownership in the United States has fallen for eight years in a row. And now it's dropped to the lowest level in 19 years. You have to keep in mind, every year the population grows. So the rate of home ownership should be growing every year just to stay even. And uh, if home ownership, you know, it's not an abstract thing. It's human beings, people like you and me, wanting to ho own the home that they're in. We're not necessarily talking about a great big mansion. It could be just a small house with a yard. But that's the American dream. I remember flying back from Russia one time uh, after my late wife died. I had this beautiful blonde Russian girlfriend for a while, went over to see her. I'm flying back, and I'm sitting by several Russian guys. And um, as we come into New York City, they look out, and we're flying low, and they can see all these suburban homes. Uh, it was JFK Airport in that area. There are some uh, areas in New York to go suburban homes. And one facet, homes, suburban homes. 
homes or something to that effect, you know. So you, you see mostly apartments uh, in Russia. That was the communist way. And, uh, you know, increasingly we seem to be going down a rabbit hole in personal fascism and communism, something horrific all this stuff. Um, let's go to number four. 52% of Americans cannot even afford the house that they're living in right now. Well, believe me, sometimes I, I know that feeling. Uh, it's expensive to keep a house up. Every uh, 15, 20 years, you're probably going to need a new roof. The way appliances are made now, my house lessens your lucky. If you get 15 years, you might only get 12 or 10 out of a $2,000 refrigerator. Stoves, all that central air, heating, it all has to be replaced. You occasionally have plumbing bills, et cetera, et cetera. This takes money. And when you're literally on the edge and there's no money left over at the end of the week or the month, uh, it's very difficult, very difficult. And so a majority of Americans in the home they're in right now, they really can't afford it because things economically have been going down, getting worse. Now, number five, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, only 36% of Americans under the age of 35 own a home. That's the lowest level that has ever been measured in the history of the American Republic. Let me go through that again. Only 36% of Americans under 35 own a home. That's a very telling thing. Uh, those are the people that should be, at that age, should be having children. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in the American Midwest in Evansville, Indiana. My mother didn't work. My father was a, a small businessman. Uh, our one grandmother lived with us. There were three kids. Uh, we didn't lock our doors. Uh, I, my wife lived in a, in a rural area, and their back door didn't even have a lock on it, you know? Uh, yet we all lived well. We always had a fairly new car and another car. Uh, once I got old enough to drive, my sister and brother, we got used cars that my dad bought for us. Uh, we, we lived pretty well. Uh, we ate steak whenever we wanted to eat it, and we took a vacation every year. We weren't rich. We were middle class, uh, maybe eventually upper middle class, but middle class. And that meant a lot, and it, it, we, were, we were lucky. Uh, America is a very rich country, and only through incredible thievery and corruption have we got to the point where we're at now, because quite frankly, our streets should be paved with gold. We're coming back in a few minutes. Stay tuned. And this is Tim Alexander, Howard Sterling, in for Dr. Bill Deagle. Uh, I want to continue with this list because it's really important. Uh, number six, right now, approximately one out of every six men in the United States that are in their prime working years, that's 25 to 54, do not have a job. Uh, number seven, the labor force participation rate for Americans from the age of 25 to the age of 29 has fallen to an all-time record low, and that's going back to 1776, folks. Uh, number eight, the number of working age Americans not employed has increased by 27 million since the year 2000. Uh, depending on the statistic, by the way, uh, there's something like uh, up to 103 working age, 103 million working age Americans that are unemployed or don't have full time jobs right now, and that is shocking. This is not a recession. It's not a recovery from a recession. This is a major global depression, and the, you know, uh, well. I'll, get to that in a minute. Number eight, the, the number of working age Americans are not employed has increased by 27% since the year 2000. Number nine, according to the government's own numbers, about 20% of the families in the entire country do not have a single member that's employed at this point. 20%, there's nobody in the entire family working. Uh, that's... That's bad. Number 10, this may sound crazy, but 25% of all American adults do not even have a single penny saved up for retirement. Well, you know, it, it, does, it doesn't sound crazy. If you're barely surviving, 
and uh, uh, one or more of the breadwinners in the family is unemployed or working part time at Wally World or Mickey D's, uh, you don't you don't can't save anything. Uh, you're just barely keeping your nose above the water. Uh, and that's what should be the richest country on earth. Number 11, as I noticed in one recent article, total consumer credit in the United States has increased by 22% over the past three years. And 56% of all Americans have subprime credit at this point. In other words, well over half of us are subprime in, in our credit rating. Uh, people are still loading up credit cards just to be able to have you know, bare necessities, things like food, medical, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Number 10, major retailers are shutting down stores at the fastest place since the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And this is where I was going to go to uh, a minute ago. The collapse of Lehman Brothers was the beginning of the Great Depression. Now, the Federal Reserve System, which is privately owned mostly by Europeans, um, the Lehman and a handful of families, eight families, 30 families, if you want to take a little bit further down, but uh, they control the Federal Reserve System. And they have been pumping money into the stock market by the billions and billions every single month. So, you know, some people, oh, well, the stock market's good. We're not in any depression. We're not in any recession. Everything's good. No, those are false figures, and it's funny money. The reality is that you have all these people unemployed and underemployed and human lives are being destroyed because the vultures at the top have led us into another depression. Number 13, it's hard to believe, but more than one out of every five children is living in poverty in 2014. It's over one out of every five children in the United States is in poverty. That's, we shouldn't have any of that. And one out of five? What in... God's name is going on in this country that we allow these political crooks in Washington to ruin everything for us. Fourteen, according to one recent report, there are 49 million Americans that are dealing with food insecurity right now. In other words, 49 million people not sure where they're going to get uh, their next meal or if they can make it through the week or the month. I volunteered in food shelters before, or you know, food soup kitchens, and it, it makes you feel good to, to do some volunteer work like that. But it's really sad, and especially sad when you see families coming in. And these are people with kids, and, and, and you know, the economy's gotten bad. They've been laid off. There aren't jobs out there, and they're coming in with their children for a free meal. That's heartbreaking to see. And much less for, can you imagine what it would be like if it's your children that you're taking to a food bank just to get food or taking someplace just to get some, some free clothes from somebody because you can't provide for them? Fifteen, uh, overall the U.S. property rate is up more than 30% since 1966 in LBJ's war on property. Um, I mean, it's, that's, it, it, it's terrible. And what's Gone with that is uh, our culture has been turned upside down. There's been a colossal shift in American values since 2001. Um, let me read off uh, uh, some some differences here. Uh, here's a few examples, and this is from a Gallup poll, Annual Values and Beliefs Survey uh, results for 2014. Now, when you compare the numbers from 20 from 2001 to 2014, uh, the difference is uh, quite striking. And here's a few examples. Those that approve of sex between unmarried man and woman, 2001, 53%, 2014, 66%. Divorce. Uh, those that uh, approve of divorce, 59% in 2001, 69% in 2014. Having a child, having a baby outside of marriage. Uh, in 2001, 45% said it was okay. In 2014, 58% said it's okay. Gay or lesbian relations. In 2001, 40% said it was okay. 2014, 58% said it's okay. Medical research using stem cells from human embryos. Uh, that's aborted human embryos, by the way. 
2001, 52% sadly said it was okay. In 2014, 65%. Let me tell you, when my wife was dying of ovarian cancer, I would have gladly traded my life uh, for hers. But we told the doctor we didn't want any experimental drugs that came uh, from aborted human embryos and from stem cells from aborted human embryos. Uh, you know, if you're facing uh, your demise or the demise of your spouse, you really want to start thinking about something like that. You say, oh, hold it, I don't want to go meeting my maker uh, having used something from aborted babies. A pornography, 2001, 30% said it was all right, 2014, 33%. Suicide, 2001, 13% said it was okay. Uh, it's not that much, but still 19% in 2014. Cloning humans, 2000, playing God, basically. Uh, only 7% in 2001, 13% in 2014. But even well beyond that, uh, as I started to say earlier, when I was a kid in the American Midwest, we, we basically, we didn't lock our doors. Um, and I remember uh, living more in town as, as a kid. Uh, we had a milkman. This is back uh, when I'm 63 years old. But uh, you had a milkman that came around and delivered dairy products. And our side door was unlocked because the milkman would come in between 5 and 6 a.m. a couple of days a week. You'd leave a little note for him and uh, some money. And uh, maybe you wanted a quart of ice cream or, uh, you know, a uh, half gallon of milk or something. And he'd make change and leave it and put the, the ice cream in the little freezer and the, uh, the milk in your refrigerator. Uh, the meter reader for the gas company would come in uh, once a month and he'd open the door and yell, meter reader! And he'd walk in the kitchen, walk down in the cellar, read the, uh, the meter, walk back out. Now, he wouldn't last a single day doing that today because he'd get, he, you know, somebody would blast him away. We've become very paranoid and for good reasons. So be there are people that are on heroin, crack, cocaine, meth, and all this crazy stuff. And they have to, to come up with literally hundreds and hundreds of dollars every week for, for their drugs. And they'll do anything. We didn't have that back in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, you, you just, uh, going back even further, in my late father's day, uh, before air conditioning, people would sometimes go to public parks in the middle of July and August with a couple sheets and lay out in the open because it was cooler. Try that today, you'd wake up with your throat slit. We're going down the tubes, morally, economically, politically, and we have to fight back. Get right with God, folks. Time is short. God loves you. God bless.